Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I really think that Bruce and Nathaniel have done something very interesting here. I think this is a great conference idea. Uh, I've been going to conferences for years, well, certainly since 2003 in VPM, and they, they go from conferences that are large and have lots of things to conferences that are narrow, but there's really been missing a conference that puts together people who are more or less technical and who are more or less sophisticated about it to talk about the issues together. Uh, I'm certainly more interested in listening in the next two days of what you have to say than probably you're less interested in listening to what I have to say, but this is the way it goes. Um, what I want to do is to try to provide some sort of context. Um, what technology, how technology is related to what's happening in the world of business. Um, let me give a little bit of background here. I, when I left college, I started working for Xerox. I actually did some process work at Xerox, and then I went to work for a guy, Gary Rumbler, in New York, who in the 60s <laughs> was doing early business process work. I mean, we did flow diagrams that showed how people were doing things in organizations. And it explains something about my background, that there were no computers then. I mean, mid-60s, some of the companies had computers, and they were using them for back office sorts of things like payroll. But nothing that we ran into had computers involved. We would be called in because the sales process wasn't working. And we'd watch what people did, and then make suggestions about how to change their jobs to make them do something better. You know, or we'd be asked to come in and look at a production line. So the worst, we worked with machinery, people, how people were doing processing jobs, and we'd make notes on what each of their movements were and so forth. So a lot of process work, but not computer work. Certainly that all changed in the course of the, in 70, I moved to California. I've lived here since then. Most of the time I had my own organization and consulted. Uh, and just because of where I was located, I did most of my consulting initially with banks and then later with computer companies. So I certainly gradually learned more and more about computing, uh, but it wasn't my initial way of thinking about process. Um, I've written three newsletters. The first newsletter I wrote, I started writing in the beginning of the 80s, and it was on expert systems and artificial intelligence. So for 10 years, I wrote a newsletter every month, <laughs> 16 pages every month on what was happening in the expert systems in the AI world. Um, in hindsight, I think of that as more business rules than anything else. Um, the second area I worked in at the very end of the, that decade was case, uh, which is, I think of it increasingly as process management in hindsight. Uh, and the third thing I wrote about was enterprise architecture uh, in the mid-90s for a few years, when it was just getting starting establishing itself as its own area. Uh, and then more recently, in 2003, I decided I'd spent so much time in, in computer areas that I really ought to get back to my roots and focus on process again. And so I wrote a book on business process change, which I spent a lot of time sitting with Gary Romer and talking about what he thought had happened in the market. I wrote that book in 2002, and then I started a website on business process change, and almost immediately was confronted with BPM or BPMS, which everyone look at, which is just as technical as any of the other computer stuff that I'd been found myself working with for years. When I think about any technology, whether it's case or expert systems or BPMS, I tend to go for Moore's technology life cycle. This is something he's written about in two or three books. But the gist of it is, he explains that there are, technology originally comes out of somewhere, a university or some great idea, and for a period of time, there are these innovators. And it's just very new, and people are trying to figure out what it is. And then there's a period of early adopters. And you have people at companies that have people who are sophisticated in technology that will explore it. They'll buy tools that maybe aren't as good as they might be or that have bugs in them, and they'll work with it. They'll invest the money it takes because they want to be ahead of the curve, and they want to take advantage of what's new there. And then there's what Moore calls a chasm. <laughs> Some of the stuff that's here that becomes, in some ways, very popular. Uh, gets a lot of attention, it's 
nonetheless doesn't cross the chasm and become part of the early majority. The early majority is that 50% of the organizations out there who want to buy technology that's reasonably safe. And they don't want to go to too much work to try to apply it in their organizations. And so they want good case studies that say, this stuff works, it's safe. Three, these well-known companies are supporting it. These well-known companies have made lots of money with it. And it's safe for us to use. And then there's another period where companies that really don't want to spend money they don't have to are finally forced <laughs> to adopt what the other 50% of the companies have already started investing in. OK, so that's a, a way of thinking about any, about expert systems, about case, uh, about BPMS. Let's look at the four technologies I've followed. Uh, expert systems. From 83 to 93, I spent a lot of time. There were big conferences on expert systems. People talked about them. Expert systems were going to be the next wave. There were television programs about them. And I would have said somewhere around 92, 93, expert systems and AI sort of stopped being exciting from a, a business point of view. Uh, it hasn't gone away. The companies that establish themselves as business, as expert system tool vendors, sort of laid low for a while and then repositioned themselves as business rule vendors. And then recently, they've been bought by BPMS companies <laughs> and incorporated into BPM tools. So it's not like the technology disappeared, but it didn't deliver on the promise that was sort of packaged in expert systems. And, and, and in hindsight, the reason it didn't was very simple. We could build an expert system that would do better reasoning than the best human expert, but it took a huge amount of work to build it, and it took even more work to maintain it. And nobody had figured out when they started promoting these systems what it would cost to maintain them. And so it turns out real human experts come to conferences like this. You change your mind every so often. You read things. You reformat how you think about problems. And so real problems that, are, that involve human experts keep changing. And the system, the technology of AI and expert systems was inadequate to maintain, to stay up to date. It costs more to maintain the systems than they were worth. Better to hire or train human experts. Uh, case. Uh, case is sort of the same way, although it's a little different. I remember going to a conference in 1989, and IBM was just introducing their latest version of what was going to be the, the case format for the future, all based on mainframes. And the next year, 91, the same conference, uh, different location, Nobody was interested in mainframes. Client server had become the rage. And everybody in every booth was saying, you know, how do you work on a, on a, a smaller machine? You know, what, do you have, what products do you have available for this? And the market just sort of went into a total change and shift. Uh, and it, wasn't, it didn't recover from that. On the other hand, the people who were involved in that were very interested in building tools that let you do so modeling. And they thought of it as software modeling at the time, but it was boxes and arrows and flow. And it was many of those vendors have become vendors in the BPMS market. Enterprise architecture, I was in it for the least period of time. Uh, I, this is a harder one to call, because you could argue it's still going on. Um, has it crossed the chasm? Uh, maybe. Lots of companies talk about enterprise architecture. It hasn't crossed the chasm in the sense that in the early days, we thought about an enterprise architecture as being a model of everything going on in the company that was well organized. And today, I think it sort of evolved into at least many of the people who talk about enterprise architecture are talking about something reasonably narrow, cataloging all this software or, or keeping track of the, the bus systems that the company relies on, the infrastructure of the company. I'm not saying it couldn't be, it isn't more in some places, but it, it hasn't realized what at least we thought the potential was in the mid-90s. And now we've got business process management, my latest market I'm following. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Where are we? And you know, are we ready to cross the chasm? Have we crossed the chasm? Are we ready to disappear? There have been a certain amount of uh, articles that have been written that suggest BPM is on the way out. They do that at least in part because we've been through an economic period in the last few years where a lot of people have cut back sharply. 
And so where you had conferences in the 2005, 6, 7 that were getting bigger, you've had conferences in 2008, 2009 that have been considerably smaller. Uh, and whether that's the economy or whether that's the BPM, let's leave that outside for the moment. When I think of business process management, I think of, well, first of all, when I think of business process, I think of, it starts with work simplification. It starts with uh, tailor and scientific management, at least in the modern sense. All through the, up to the World War II, you have people having conferences on work simplification, on industrial engineering, where they're trying to specify exactly how things are handled on an assembly line. That sort of evolves into quality control and then mutates into various forms like Six Sigma and Lean. If you look at the number of books out there that more or less talk on business process, you'll find there are more of them on Six Sigma and on Lean than there are on BPMS by a good bit. There are a lot of people out there who think of themselves as process people whose primary way of understanding the world is Six Sigma or Lean or quality control. You've got another whole group of people who come out of information technology. Starting in certainly the late 60s, 70s, companies have been putting more and more time and more and more energy into automating what's done. I think most of us probably have a strong feeling that that just continues. <laughs> the further we go down the line, the more automated things are become. I mean, when I was in expert systems for a while, I realized, you know, it may take a long time. We're not ready to do it yet, perhaps. But there's almost nothing that isn't going to be automated if we keep working at it. It's just a matter of time and figuring out what you're trying to do exactly enough. But information technology has its own cut on process. And then there's a school at the top that I put down as business management, for lack of a better name. And it's sort of the school that I feel most allegiance to because I worked with Gary Rumler. And that was his sort of approach, which is a very top-down. It's the same approach Michael Hammer took. In other words, you, if you really want to make a company better, you don't think about specific adjustments. You think about what business are we in? What are we trying to do? How could we really revolutionize this industry? You think about something like Amazon and you know, rethinking how we sell books and just changing the industry completely, putting the other guys so far behind that they're virtually out of business before they even understand what happened. OK, so that's the, the top down. What are the big processes? What are we trying to do in this organization? And then I think of BPM today as being trying to combine all of these. And if I think of the business process software area, I think of that as BPMS. And this is a fight I've had from 2003 on. And I, I don't really care if you call it BPM, but from my point of view, BPM software, because I want to use the broader term, BPM, business process management, for this whole thing. And the certain number of companies that I go into, their primary concern is how do we manage all this? How do we make it work throughout the whole organization? We have people in IT that are doing process stuff. We have people in Lean. We have people in Six Sigma. We have people that are trying to do top-down stuff, enterprise transformation, innovation. How do we put this all together? So if I had my druthers, I'd prefer to have BPM be how do we put it all together. And I'd prefer to have BPMS is the software that we use as we to help us put it all together. We do a survey at BP Trends every other year. We've done it for four times now, so for eight years. We've asked people different kinds of questions. And just for your own, for our sake, the number of people that are interested in BPM, 100%, everybody that took our survey, the number of people who think BPM is synonymous with software or software technology, 16%. OK. So the sample may be a little bit skewed, but it's people from all over the world. It's about 450 people the last time we did it. And a lot of people think about BPM as, as Six Sigma. A lot of people think about BPM as lean. A lot of people think of it as, as innovation or something else. And certainly a certain number of them think of it as software. But when you're trying to think about software systems and how do we, where are we with software and how do we make this all work together, you have to think, you don't have to, but I suggest you think <laughs> that you're part of a broader movement which is trying to get companies to think about processes and how to use processes to improve their companies. 
And then your part of this is that you're going to offer the software that's going to make this happen. Um, meanwhile, all these other things, the lean, decision management, the feedback, human performance, IT, Six Sigma, all of these things are being integrated at a very rapid rate. Um, you meet the wrong person at the wrong conference, and you, you hear somebody, a Six Sigma person, only wants to talk Six Sigma. There's nothing else in the world but Six Sigma, and that's the beginning and the end of it. Um, but you meet somebody else at a little different conference, and they're very interested in how does Six Sigma work with BPM? Or can Six Sigma people use BPMS tools, and which one should we use? So I mean, people, not everyone is flexible, but the, the smartest people in process in every one of these fields is flexible enough that they're trying to explore all the other possibilities. And so, and I mean, I've written t chapters for two books in the last year and a half. One of them was a Six Sigma book, and the other one was a Lean book. And they both came to me and said, give us something about how BPM fits into all this. So you're seeing people reaching out and building bridges. Um, here's another. I had a long talk with a BPMS vendor. And we were talking about whether the training that, that BP Trends sometimes gives was appropriate for their tool. So they were explaining to me how their tool worked and what training they already gave. And they described the software system that they were building in their tool. And I started just arbitrarily saying, OK, this particular little software system, it establishes part, a part vendor's list so that you can decide what part vendor to buy from. So I just sort of popped up and said, well, the system that contains that is, and the system that contains that. And so I popped up about five levels to get to a value chain. You know, we're, we're trying to sell widgets here, and at some way down in this level here, we need to know what part vendors are available for, available for to get parts for the widget, the machines that build the widgets, okay? So it's just, you use very different technologies or different approaches at different levels. There's nothing right or wrong about which level you work at, but you do want to be sure. If you're interested in how many value chains does the company have, that's the question Hammer used to insist that people answer first. How many value chains does your, your company have? Okay, if you're interested in how many big processes make up those value chains and what their relationships are, you've got a different set of questions up here. These are architecture business architecture, process, business process architecture questions. You get in the middle range, you have a lot of redesign questions. You get in this range, and you have a lot of questions about how would I implement this. The other thing that I rely on all the time is a BP as maturity model. The CMM may be not be correct. It was, got, it was done for different purposes. It was originally done to decide how, whether companies were prepared to give the DOD software on time and on schedule. And the people who developed CMM said, you know, a company that understands its process, that has it well defined, that has done it over and over again and has good metrics, can probably deliver your, your software on time. And if they haven't done it before, or they don't have metrics, or they haven't done it consistently, they're a lot less likely to deliver software on time and on schedule. So it was just they built process right into this approach. Okay, you've got organizations with no process. You've got organizations that are working to figure out what their processes are. You've got organizations that are doing architecture. They have most of their processes, and now they're trying to relate them all together and use information at the architecture level to make decisions. Uh, you have people at level four where you have managers assigned and you have metrics and people are using statistical tools to measure whether those processes are meeting their goals or not. And at the very top, you have companies that do all this consistently and have invested in teams that do this. Okay, well, leave the problems of, of how this works in all cases and all companies aside. The generalization that they've done, having done a lot of companies and studied them, is most organizations are somewhere between level two and level three. They're about here. Their, their process work is being done at the departmental level. Process is being done by people in the departments who think they have problems with their process and want to fix them. 
They want to figure out what their processes are. They want to solve the problems and fix the problems they have. Okay, that's very different from somebody who feels like most of their processes are correct and are interested in aligning them and keeping, what, keeping track of the relations and getting good metrics on all their processes. And it's different altogether than people who are shifting the organization so that they manage. Every process is managed and has somebody responsible for it. My personal consulting at the moment is mostly in this area. But the company, as a company, when we sell training, it's mostly in this area. Okay, so these are, it's a different way of segmenting the market, if you would. But it's important to keep this in mind. Most companies are simply not very sophisticated about process. I've often said it's a, there's a sense in which the best BPMS tools are trying to sell the ability to do this up here to companies that are trying to do this. OK? There's just a disconnect with what the company is, is trying to do and what the tools are capable of doing for them. OK. With that kind of a background, I then ask myself, where have we been since 2002? And when I tried to answer that question, I came up with this chart. I don't expect you to read that from where you are. I will make these slides available on the BPM Next website if any of you want to come back and, and download them and get them in larger size. But the gist of what I did, I started off and I put down problems that I think of at the process level. In other words, what are the issues that people working at, with businesses about processes have to deal with. So the decline of Six Sigma, the rise of SCORE, the integration of BPM and balanced scorecard, the trying to deal with very dynamic processes. Okay, these are process issues that business people are focused on. Then I came back and I said, okay, so what are some of the technology issues? You know, ERP, uh, whether we how you integrate workflow and EAI. Uh, how you work, integrate workflow EAI and business rules. Um, process mining. Uh, BPM, BPMN2. Uh, decision management in the sense of going from business rules to stepping back from that and developing a business, a decision management model prior to doing a business rules model. And then at the bottom, I put down the bus or the platform involved. So in 2003, we started out talking about client server and XML. You know, we're going to do, we're going to build these systems that use this new technology, XML, that could allow us to connect things more quickly. And then a little bit later on, nobody was interested in client server. They were interested in SOA or service architectures. And then a little bit longer, a little bit further on, we've got all these smartphones and iPads and a whole collection of mobile issues. And now we have the cloud, we have social media, we have big data, okay? The argument I'm gonna make here is that when you think about BPMS and anybody says, well, has it crossed the chasm or not? The first question you ask is, what are we talking about? What is BPM? What is BPMS? It's a moving target. You know, in the few years that we've been involved in it, the interest of people in the process, management people in the process area, has changed rather radically from thinking of process more or less as manufacturing, thinking of it as more or less a well-defined procedure, to thinking of it in all kinds of different ways. Uh, it's gone from thinking about we have a workflow tool and we want to add an EAI capability, enterprise application integration capability, to thinking we want to add rules, to thinking we want to add mining. And then meanwhile, we're changing the platforms that these things are running on. Okay, so we're, we're not talking about a thing here. We're not talking about we're going to build a BPMS tool. We're talking about integrating a lot of different technology at a lot of different levels that's changing pretty rapidly. What are, what are the problems organizations face? Uh, we're, forget everything else. We're in the middle of a major transition to a world economy. Uh, in the 50s, if you took an MBA, they'd talk about a continental economy. And what they talked about was how Sloan was such a genius at GM because he realized how to arrange an organization so that it could sell 
to the whole North American continent. How many factories did you need and where did they need to be placed? How many storage places do you need and where did they need to be placed? How did you set up a sales organization to market to the whole continent? How did you set up a marketing organization that would deal with the whole United States? And in most industries, there ended up being three leading companies, a dominant like General Motors and two secondaries, Ford and Chrysler, or a dominant like uh, Coca-Cola and subdominants like uh, Pepsi-Cola and 7-Up. And, uh, so each of these areas where the mature company solved the problem, the continental problem, you, the market settled down with a leading company and a couple of subdominants. That's what we're trying to do on the world scale, and nobody has quite done it yet. Who knows how many companies there are? You know, when, when I first started thinking about these issues 10 years ago, there were probably 20, 50, third, closer to 50 car companies. Now they're down to a few, lot less, say 10 or 11 real car companies, a lot of subs people that have been bought by one company or another. I don't know how far it'll go down. I don't think three is probably the number for the whole world, but it's probably <laughs> closer to three than to 10 or 15 or 20. Okay, so this is a transition we don't necessarily understand, but it's happening and it's gonna continue to happen. Somebody was talking early, a moment ago about 3D printing. I think 3D printing is going to revolutionize everything. 3D printing means that the way car companies work today, they build a new brand, a new car and ship it, and then they build a backlog of parts for that car and they ship them out and put them in inventory around the world and individual car companies buy certain numbers and put them in inventory and they start maintaining those on a multi-year schedule so that if you drive a car in which is four years old, you can get valves or you can get whatever parts you need for that car at the, at the part dealership huge amounts of money are involved in making that happen. That all is going to go away. We're going to have a printer, <laughs> and the car company is going to ship out a computer diagrams of each of those parts, and you're going to come in and ask for a part, and they're going to print it for you. And you know, how long that takes, whether that's done in four years or 10 years or 20 years, it isn't so important as the fact it is going to happen. It's going to change everybody's idea about where money is in a supply chain. Okay, that just keeps going in all kinds of different areas. Um, this is one of my favorites. This pretty much tracks the music industry in my lifetime. I remember as a kid in Indianapolis going to see large rec L vinyl records pressed out at an RCA factory in Indianapolis. And that would be about here. And you start coming along here and there are lines that show up. So Sony introduces Walkman. That's at this point, right here. Sony introduces Walkman, and you see the cassette business start to grow, and this business start to go down. And then you've got over here, the first CD is marketed in the United States, and you see this start to grow, and this start to go down, and up at the very end here, this ends in, in uh, what is it, 2006. At the very end up there, you see digital music is just starting, has been introduced, and you've got the CD market, hasn't really started to go down yet, but it will. This is true in almost every industry. It's a little different in some industries than other, but these major shifts in technology, it's not just the companies that press the LPs, it's the stores that handled them, it's the people that printed the covers, it's the people that, that made the technology to record the music. It all keeps changing. This is 3D printing. That little version at the top is printing out plastic stuff, and that printer is on the market now for $1,500. You can print out all kinds of plastic junk. <laughs> this, on the other hand, is an Audi <laughs> that was printed on a very large, sophisticated printer that sold for a lot more. But the point is, they wanted to prototype that Audi, and they printed it for the show. Problems process managers face. Most books on process talk about process as if it were in the manufacturing world. We start off doing things, we start off doing things there, there uh, go step by step, things get done. Most people today live in the service world. There's not a, a sequence. Start here and go step, step, step. There is an interaction between the customer and the company, the customer asks for something, you query the customer about what they want, they give it more specific specification, other questions are asked, their credit is checked, 
this process just continues. In a manufacturing operation, you can do quality control at the end. You know, we don't want to turn out products that aren't good. And when the products are put in the box and shipped, we want them all to be correct. In a service model, every interaction between the customer is another possibility for messing up and having the customer not want to do business with you anymore. Every interaction is just as important in keeping the customer happy and satisfied. And they begin when the customer talks about the product, and they run right through the life cycle of that product. Okay, totally different way of thinking about process. Um, social media. We're talking now about not you hand off to somebody else in the same place and they do something and hand it off to somebody else. We're talking about you hand it to somebody and they go online and are contacting people in other companies, in other buildings, in other parts of the world and accumulating the information they need to make a decision about what they're going to do next. How do you model that? Okay, That kind of dynamics that's going to happen. Um, Multi-company supply chains are increasingly involved. And one of the things that happened when Japan had its earthquake is that a whole series of parts suppliers were out of business. And companies who were dependent on that were going all over the world trying to find out where they could get things to keep their production lines running when those production lines in Japan, when those sources in Japan dried up. Companies are now thinking about maintaining supply chain systems that let them dynamically shift from suppliers constantly as things change, as prices change, as availability changes, as crises occur. Okay, I'm not going through this entire list just because of time, but I want to emphasize what's called case management or, demand, or dynamic processes has become very much a focus today. In other words, how can we build more dynamic processes than we've ever built? Um, when I think about the, the, the gap at most companies, I think that the, the gap from a process person, from a person who's business process oriented, is between level two and level three, and the gap occurs because senior management doesn't want to commit to process. It is, in other words, at this level, the guys in divisions can decide their processes are broken, and they probably have the authority to go out and hire somebody to build a software system or to do a process work and redesign their system. Okay? When they get up to here and somebody says, let's, let's do this throughout the whole company, that's a big gap. Okay? That takes senior management's commitment. So moving into this area requires that the senior management in the company says process is important to us. Okay, process is a good way to think about the world. We don't want to think about it some other way. We want to think about a, series, a connected series of activities that stretch across all of our functional units, or most of our functional units, and that produces value for specific customers. And we want to tie everything in the company to that sequence that produces value, because that lets us know whether we're succeeding or not. And you back up into that supply chain, and you look at this process, and you look at the activities, and you say, are these activities contributing to this production of value? That's the, pro that's the process idea as it was started a long time ago. Certainly, it was presented by Hammer and by Rumbler, and certainly the way I would present it. OK, process is a way of thinking about organizing your company. Lots of managers don't think about it that way. They take an MBA, and they specialize in finance. They take an MBA, and they specialize in marketing. They work hard at marketing, and they're very good at it. And in 20 years, somebody taps them to be the CEO of a company. And all of a sudden, they're trying to think about how everything in that company fits together and works. Okay, It's hard. <laughs> and selling management is probably the hardest piece. OK, technologies, you know more about these than I do. Uh, how do we fit with ERP? Are we better than ERP? Are we more flexible? Uh, how do we deal with business models? Do we need BPMN? Is BPMN too IT oriented? How do we deal with rules? How important is decision management? What are we really trying to do with rules? The business rules idea was sort of simple. We got policies, and we just take those policies, and we f logically figure out what rules follow from them. People have started to shift now, and they're doing more like expert systems. They're looking at individuals who are solving problems and saying, how does that individual solve that problem? And what are the rules that are used to make that decision? 
and you'll find that that isn't easy. It's easier to take a policy and derive rules from it. It's harder to look at an individual who is good at making decisions and figuring out exactly what that individual does when they make those decisions. Okay. Um, adaptive case management. How do you deal with those dynamic systems? How do you model a system where people are sending emails all over the world? Uh, process mining. What role does it really have and how do we fit it in? And then platforms. I don't know where platforms are going to go. All I can tell you is that so far in the last decade, they've kept changing. And they'll probably continue to change. And the social media are probably going to make them change even more quickly. And you guys are going to have to worry about what platform should we be on or how do we build the latest version of our product so that whatever platform it's on, we can move to the next platform when we need to. Okay. I've sort of created this picture of a lot of complexity and a lot of different technologies all vying for a place in some future BPMS product that will integrate them all and provide us a tool base for people who want to work in the whole business process area. One thing I can give you as positive news is that in the eight years that BP Trends has done surveys, for the first six of those years, the people's attitudes towards BPMS did not change. A few more were you willing to use it, and a few more said they were interested in it, but it wasn't really significant. Last year, for the first time, we had a real jump in the number of people who said they were interested in BPMS, they were committing to BPMS. Okay, now we're not talking about going from 50 to 100, we're talking about going from 40 to 60, but that's still important. A lot of people said they were interested. If you want my own estimation, and it's more or less seat of the pants, I'd say that the BPM, BPMS market together are growing at about 15% a year. That's not exciting compared to some technologies where you talk about 100%, but it's been steady growth. Companies continue to make money. They continue to sell products. I do a model of this that has a lot more, but this is just IBM, and I'm only using IBM because it's a convenient example. It's written a lot about, okay? These are the companies that IBM has bought over the course of the last decade. IBM is assembling, <laughs> assembling a BPMS product, and they've continued to buy one company after another, some for BI, some for modeling, some for rules, different, for different purposes to assemble a product. The last time they came out with a product, I wouldn't say this is the simplest model in the world. Uh, a modeling tool on the top, an execution, process execution manager, an operational business rules, a decision manager, and a case manager sitting on top of a monitoring environment. But if any of you have looked at IBM descriptions of what BPMS is four years ago or five years ago, the models were even more complex than this. This is a significant simplification. Okay, I would have said even four or five years ago, that yes, there's consolidation in the market. Lots of vendors have bought up other vendors. But <laughs> at the moment, what you have are one company owning six other companies and now has the problem of how do they put it together? How do they build an interface that somebody can use that sits on top of all five of these different products that were built by different companies to do slightly different things? And I would say IBM has made a major step forward. This looks a lot alike, it feels a lot alike, and I'm not saying it's IBM alone. So there's, there's been a lot of consolidation in the market, and some of the leading vendors in the market have made real strides in the last two or three years of starting to pull this stuff together. That's good news. Do I think BPMS has crossed the chasm? No, I don't. And I realize that anybody in a company that's making a lot of money this year wants to say that's happened, but the early majority, the 50% the of these people out here that want to buy products, want to buy products when they're convinced that there are really good examples of working solutions that people have demonstrated and that they're happy with and consistent and that they cost a reasonable amount of money and that the products are reasonably, have been in the market for a while and are reasonably easy to use. And I don't think we're there yet. I think. These companies are still looking at the market, just like they were in AI market, looking at it even after 10 years, 
and saying there's a lot of confusion going on out there, and I don't see these great examples people keep saying that might happen. Okay, so we've, we've been at it for 10 years. We haven't crossed the chasm. I don't see that as a problem immediately. In other words, if, if it was a simpler market, if it were business rules or if it were expert systems, I might say, gee, 10 years is kind of long. But if you look at this market and you say, this is not just <laughs> in some abstract market of a particular technology, this is the expert system market with those tools that were developed to handle rules now being used in a different way. And this is the case market with tools that were built to model how you do software and now being used in a different way. Okay, this is a market that is pulling together a lot of different strands and trying to build a platform. And it's gonna be a platform, if it's done right, that will allow business people and IT people to talk together in a reasonably straightforward way about the kinds of very concrete things business is trying to accomplish. How do we make sales? <laughs> you know, if our business model changes and we're going to produce a different product with new technology, what will that look like? And how fast can we implement that? Okay, we want a platform that both the business, the business analysts, the business managers, and the IT people can look at and say, yes, this makes it all fit together for me. And if I want to do decisions, I've got rules. And if I want to do something very dynamic, I have some way of managing the flow of email messages. And if I want to model a customer interaction with a business process, I have a way of doing that. I don't envy you guys trying to make all that happen <laughs> or fit it all together in a simple package. Uh, I don't think it's been done yet, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe it's possible and it'll happen. Um, if I was going to give advice, I'd say even technology companies need to spend time trying to sell process to management. The, the whole market won't become mature until senior managers are more committed to process. I see lots of technology companies trying to push the technology too hard, and they can get the IT people to buy it, they can even get the middle managers to buy it, but if business, senior management doesn't believe in process as a real way to improve their company, then there's a limited lifespan. You sell one product, you sell five instances, there's five applications, uh, and the company doesn't go on. What you want is companies that are committed, so once they start doing it, they start thinking every process in this company should be defined in these tools and managed in this way. And then BPMS needs some great examples. And if you've got one out there and the client doesn't want to talk about it, I don't know what to say, but pressure them. <laughs> we need to have examples. I run into it all the time. I, I use an example of a worldwide supply chain that is managed from some senior supply chain manager's desk, and they immediately say, well, where is that? Who did that? How many of them have been done? And so I end up backing up and saying, well, it, I don't know that it's been done yet, but it's, it's what we're trying to do. It's the kind of thing we're trying to do. Make it possible for reasonably senior people in the company to have a strong overview of how big processes work and whether they're successful and where there are problems or bottlenecks. I absolutely believe that can be delivered. I even believe it'll probably be delivered in this decade. <laughs> uh, but I'm convinced that crossing the, we're not crossing the chasm yet. And if we're gonna do it, it's gonna take a push. And it's gonna take a push to combine technologies that are not trivial to combine. It's gonna take a push to put an interface on them that makes it possible for a wide variety of different people to use them. Uh, and it's gonna take a, just a push to overcome all of the confusion in the market about what is process and whether what we're trying to do and are we looking at customers or suppliers or, or different, all these different processes. Having a story that, that works for these different people about how we're gonna solve your process problems. I don't mean to create more problems than I have solutions. Uh, as I told you, I'm, I'm excited about the idea that I'm gonna spend the next two days listening to you guys talk about these issues. Um, I think you have challenges, very big challenges, and I wish you all the luck in the world trying to solve them. Thank you. Okay.